Hey folks, it's Dr. Gilchrist with your very last lecture for Sensation and Perception. Um, so I thought I would do something a little bit different and I thought that I would, for the first time that I've ever taught this class, talk a little bit about smell and combine it with taste. And as you're going to see uh, throughout this lecture, part of the reason that I've chosen to combine them is because, first of all, smell and taste are very, very interdependent sen senses. They rely on each other. Information from smell helps inform our sense of taste, for example. Additionally, unlike a lot of the other senses that we've talked about, these are very, very similar to each other in that they are chemical senses. So, um, I know that your book has very long chapters for both of these. I've tried to condense down to the most basic stuff where I could because I know it's your last week of classes. Um, if you are planning on taking um, the optional final, there will be very few sections on smell and taste, uh, very few questions, so you ought to be okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with our sense of smell, which is also known as olfaction. And here's kind of what we're going to cover. Um, so we are going to talk a little bit about the physiology and the connections uh, to the brain. We'll talk about psychophysics related to smell. So what does it take to detect a smell? Can we discriminate between smells? Are there individual differences in psychophysical properties and perceptions? Perception of smells, and then we'll talk a little bit about smells that we like and smells that we don't. So smell, as I kind of mentioned, is a chemical sense. Now, something is going to have an odor when a chemical sense is translated into a smell, and these chemicals are what are known as odorants. So here's the thing, not every chemical necessarily emits an odor. So for example, here we have menthol, that absolutely is um, an odorant. Here we have isobutyl meth methoxopyrazine, um, which is basically translated into the smell of green bell pepper. That's actually a smell that I don't mind. It's very, very clean and very, very fresh and green, like freshly cut grass, which is another one of my favorite smells. Um, those are things that we are going to be able to smell. Now, here are a couple of other chemicals. Um, so we have like methane and we have carbon monoxide, both chemicals, but do not actually have a huge sense of smell. And this can be really important because especially in the cases of something like carbon monoxide, you can't smell it. And so it can build up in homes, it can build up in garages. And so it can be really dangerous, especially if you have a house that uses gas power like we do. Uh, one of the things that you may be surprised to know is that um, when your pilot light goes out, they actually have, they add like a sulfurish kind of eggy, rotten egg smell. And that's to let you know that something is wrong, that your pilot light is out and that you're potentially having a gas leak. Um, and part of the reason for that is that neither of these chemicals carry an odor on their own. So what does it take to actually be an odorant. First of all, they need to be volatile chemicals. In this particular case, that means that they actually need to move throughout the air. They need to be small, and they also need to be water repellent. So that's what it takes to make uh, a chem to basically make a chemical something that you can smell. So one of the things that's actually kind of interesting about your sense of smell is that by and large, your sense of smell is done through the nose. Just like vision is used with your eyes and hearing is done with your ears and touch is basically done through your skin. Now what's kind of different about all of the other senses that we've talked about is the primary goal of the eye is to see. The primary goal of the ear is to hear and the primary goal of the skin beyond being a protectant is also to sense different things in the environment so that you can act on them and touch them and be touched. But your nose is for smelling, but that's not the primary reason for your nose. You need to breathe. <laughs> you need to breathe to be alive. And the nose is primarily 
for filtering and humidifying the air that we breathe. And the fact that it also allows us to smell is kind of like a bonus perk. So what you're looking at here is the olfactory apparatus. So we have um, our nose. So air and odorants will go through the nose. Inside of your nasal cavity, you have these... Um, you have these little ridges that are known as turbinates. What the turbinates basically do is they create areas of uh, basically turbulence, updrafts and downdrafts that allow odorants and air to basically get up in this little area known as the olfactory cleft. So an olfactory cleft is basically the spa narrow space where air flows. These ridges help direct that air and those chemicals up to the cleft. And in that cleft, we have what is called the olfactory epithelium, which is located right here. The olfactory epithelium is a thick mucous membrane that is basically there to help detect odorants. As you can kind of see, uh, the axons of our uh, sensory neurons in the nose, so our olfactory sensory receptors, they'll make contact with the olfactory bulb at the base of the brain. So the olfactory epithelium contains three different types of cells. So these cells here in pink are basically supporting cells. They provide a structural function and they provide a metabolic function. What you see here are what are known as basal cells. So these small little cells are what are known as basal cells. Depending on the circumstances, they're kind of like stem cells. They can basically grow into uh, new supporting cells or they can grow into um, olfactory cells. And then finally, we have these different olfactory sensory neurons. Now, what's interesting here, they don't actually come in different colors. What you're kind of seeing here is that the different colors are telling you what kind of um, receptor they respond to. So here you can see the olfactory cilia. These basically connect to the dendrites of the olfactory sensory neuron, and that basically is where odorants can be picked up. So odorants will make contact with the cilia uh, that are embedded just outside of the mucous membrane. And what we're going to find is that for an olfactory sensory neuron, it takes about seven to eight different odorant contacts to basically generate an action potential. And once you have 40 of those action potentials, at that point, you will report smelling something. So your ability to smell something is based on basically getting at least 40 action potentials for that particular stimulus. So your sense of smell is pretty good. But your sense of smell is not as good as my dog Smedley's or any dog for that matter. Um, we can actually detect over 100 trillion different smells. And it used to be believed for a lot of different reasons that um, humans were, did not have very good senses of smell. We actually do. It's not as good as other members of other species. It's not going to be as good as a dog's. Um, but it's still pretty darn good, all things considered. Uh, we have about 5 to 10 million um, olfactory sensory neurons. Um, but dogs have about 100 times more. And more of their brain is devoted to olfaction than ours is. We have a very small area that's devoted to olfaction. We don't even have a very specific cortex for it. Um, but what's kind of interesting is that we make we make up for it by having a better sense of taste. That's why dogs like to eat poo, I think. Because um, their sense of smell is good, but their taste is bad, and they don't realize that what they're eating is gross. But what's actually kind of interesting, and I thought I'd share this with you, um, so here you are looking at kind of the sniff track of a dog, kind of looks a little bit like Smedley, um, basically trying to sniff the scent of a pheasant. Um, they actually did really similar studies with human beings. Humans had to basically crawl on all fours like a dog, and they were basically trying to um, detect the scent of some chocolate. And uh, what you can actually kind of see is that the scent tracking, the serpentine-like scent, uh, scent tracking mechanism looks a lot like a dog's. So our smell, our sense of smell is better than we think, 
But it's probably not as good as a dog's. It's not as good as an African elephant's. Um, it's just not. We have other senses that we use a lot more. So when we're dealing with our olfactory sensory neurons, I mentioned that the dendrites are here. They make contact with odorants. That information will be sent through to the axons, which you see here basically are little bundles that are going through this little section of bone known as the cribriform plate. So the cribriform plate uh, is a small, very thin bone. It has holes in it. And basically the axons of these olfactory sensory neurons basically travel through the holes in this bone in bundles and basically start making contact with these structures inside the olfactory bulb known as a glomerulus or gr bleh, glomerulus. Um, the plural is glomeruli. So basically the axons will converge on these different glomeruli. Notice that there are different types of glomeruli and they're making contact with very specific types of odorants. So notice that the axons from the uh, certain receptors here coated in blue make contact with uh, a blue glomerulus. Now obviously these are not specifically referring to colors. We are talking about uh, very specific receptor types. Um, each axon is going to make contact with a medial glomerulus and a lateral glomerulus. So each axon is going to make contact with two glomeruli and the activity that you uh, basically have patterned here will help you determine the type of odor that you experience. And then after the glomeruli, they're going to make contact with other types of cells, um, such as the mitral cells, the tufted cells, and then finally the granule cells before they um, make contact with the olfactory cortex. So this is what's going on inside the olfactory bulb. Remember that our sense of smell does not actually go to the thalamus, it goes to the olfactory bulb before traveling to the cortex. Now I do really quick, um, I'll talk a little bit more about the cribriform plate in a bit. Um, one of the things that we know about the cribriform plate is that it's actually incredibly fragile. Um, if you get a blow to the head with respect to the cribriform, uh, if you get a blow to the head or a head injury, it can sometimes be enough to break the cribriform plate. And what we know is that if you break that cribriform plate, it's not that uncommon to have a uh, anosmia which basically means you lose part of your sense of smell. And odds are pretty good you're kind of hearing a little bit about anosmia as a potential symptom of um, COVID-19. Um, it's a very, very rare symptom. And by and large, um, anosmia with a variety of different disorders is not uncommon. Uh, chemotherapy can potentially cause it. Uh, certain types of drugs can actually cause it, like antidepressants. Um, probably the biggest cause of anosmia is sinus infections. Generally, what we are going to find with some of those respiratory um, diseases like or disorders like sinus infections, flu, and cold is that the anosmia they cause is temporary. If, however, you end up damaging that cribriform plate, you're basically damaging the axons in this process, and it's possible that the damage, when you damage the cribriform plate, the anosmia is going to be permanent to some degree. So after making contact with the olfactory bulb, it is going to have projections to primary and secondary olfactory cortex. Now, whereas previously all of our different senses, except for vestibular, had their own primary cortex particularly devoted to one sense, you can kind of see that our primary and our secondary olfactory cortex are parts of the brain that are devoted to a lot of other activities besides smell. So our primary olfactory cortex is right here. That is made up of the amygdala, the parahippocampal gyrus, uh, the entorhinal cortex, and part of the limbic system which can potentially explain why many of our memories of different types of scents have a very strong memory component. Our memory for scents is really good, and they often will uh, persist for very strong emotional content. Ah. 
And then additionally, after that, that will project to secondary olfactory cortex, which is basically parts of the orbitofrontal cortex. Um, the orbitofrontal cortex, if you've heard about it in my other classes, we've kind of talked about it as an area that is really critical for kind of pr helping process um, some of the emotions that we might experience and basically trying to inhibit the limbic system and behave in socially appropriate ways. But as you can kind of see here, it is very much like we see um, with our uh, primary olfactory cortex, a part of the brain that is devoted to a lot of other aspects than just smell. Now, one thing that I will mention, um, if you are like me, you probably cry when you chop onions, and I cry when I chop onions all the time. Um, part of the reason that this happens is because um, odorants don't just stimulate our olfactory system. Um, the olfactory system is not that far away from uh, the trigeminal nerve. So our olfactory nerve is basically cranial nerve, one of the very first cranial nerves. If I'm not mistaken, it's number one. Our trigeminal nerve is basically cranial nerve number five, and you can actually see it here. And the trigeminal nerve is basically a facial sensory nerve that has a lot of different outputs, areas like the teeth, the jaw, the tongue, um, and in the roof of the mouth, and quite a few in the nose as well. So what we tend to find is that odorants will basically not only stimulate um, the olfactory system, they also stimulate our somatosensory system via the trigeminal nerve. Um, and that's and what will happen is that basically when these odorants make contact with parts of the trigeminal nerve, we have a lot of different polymodal nociceptors. Um, we have polymodal nociceptors that respond to things like temperature, um, that respond to things like pressure and chemical senses and burn. And so what ends up happening is that because we can't really distinguish our olfactory nerve sensation from our trigeminal nerve sen sensation, we tend to experience it as an odor. So that's sometimes why sniffing cool menthol scents also produces an actual feeling of being cool. Or um, if you swish mouthwash or Listerine. And this is also why you tend to cry when you cut onions. Those uh, molecules of odorants for those onions are basically also stimulating your trigeminal nerve, causing pain, and basically uh, enacting that crying response to basically protect your eyes and things like that. So now we're going to briefly talk about psychophysical studies of smell. So one of the things that researchers know very, very well, and odds are pretty good you've experienced this anecdotally, um, your recognition of odors remains very, very stable over several days, several months, and possibly even years. Um, and so, for example, um, I can think of a couple of different types of perfumes that I've worn or different types of perfumes that my mother has worn. Um, for example, I think Calvin Klein you Euphoria was a very popular one maybe about 10 years ago, all those fruity floral perfumes that were on the market, um, and I wore it, and my mom wore it, and even 10 years from now, if I smell it, I go, is that Calvin Klein's Euphoria? So we're really, really good at remembering different types of scents. Um, so here you kind of see percentage of correct recognition. Um, in this particular research study, they were looking at recognition over varying retention intervals up to 30 days. And as you can see, you're probably pretty good within the first 30 seconds. But generally what we find is that after those 30 seconds, your memory gets a little bit worse, but it's still pretty stable for up to 30 days. 30 days. And there's a lot of anecdotal research, there's a lot of anecdotes that suggest that it's longer than that. But here's the thing. Recognition is really different from detecting a scent. You don't have to recognize a scent to be able to detect one, and you don't have to recognize a scent to be able to discriminate 
between different scents. Now, I'm not going to spend that much time on this, but um, researchers have utilized different types of methods to test detection. Uh, generally, they use um, a variation of the method of limits known as the staircase method. So just as a reminder, the method of limits is basically we are looking for when your system shifts from I don't detect it, I don't detect it, I don't detect it, now I do, and I detect it, I detect it, I detect it, now I don't. So what we often will do is we'll have uh, different periods where we start with the smallest possible stimulus and we keep increasing the intensity until somebody detects it. So we start that staircase method. So we keep increasing until somebody says they detect it. Now, likewise, we can start with the highest intensity possible and keep reducing that intensity until the person goes from detecting it to no longer detecting it, a reverse staircase method. And we're basically looking at those crossover points for ascending and descending limits to figure out where that threshold is. Another thing that we can do is what's called a triangle test. Present people with three different odors and ask them which one is different from the other two. So two are the same, one is different. How do we figure out which is which? 